Hello everyone, my name is Kellen Pote-Vaughn, as I was introduced earlier. Um, I am a senior technical consultant for Encatech. Uh, most people are not familiar with what the name comes from, Encatech, so I like to explain it. Um, Carrie Osborne and the other gentleman that created this company do not like to wear neckties, so a I guess you'd say they all came together and realized that they could just mix the letters up in the word necktie and come up with something new. So that's where the source of the word Incatech comes from. Um, I'm a multi-platform tuning specialist, and what that means is I have worked on the dark side. Um, I've worked in SQL Server as long as I've worked in Oracle. Uh, I am in the middle of finishing up a couple chapters on an APRESS SQL Server book. At the same time, I am starting one for Oracle for APRESS as well. And that one happens to be on EM12C, which you see there on the next line. I am now considered somehow an EM12C specialist. Uh, I think it's I just ended up having one of the first ones in production around. And uh, I do like the EM12C environment. Um, the Enterprise Manager, I think, is a tool that's just amazing at uh, how it's embraced ASH as well as AWR data to supply everyone a graphic interface to performance um, management job, jobs, everything is really incredible. So I do spend a lot of time over there and you see a lot of that on my blog. I am an Oracle Ace. Uh, I do like to tell people if you want to contribute to this Oracle community, definitely do so. There's some incredible people in it. Um, they're very good about recognizing those that want to contribute and be part of it. So definitely look into it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, training Days Director at RMUG. Rocky Mountain Oracle User Group is an incredible group of people in this area. Um, I'm in the Denver area, Denver, Colorado, so it is like 9, 11 a.m. here. It's early morning. Um, we have uh, a Training Days conference that goes on every February, and we have just under 1,000 people that show up. And uh, I'm I just impressed with the support that we have from people like Jonathan Lewis and Maria Colgan. Um, just it's just so much fun. Deborah Lilly, they all show up every year and we have a great time presenting in the middle of sometimes two feet of snow and then we go skiing up in Breckenridge, so it's a lot of fun. Um, check out our mug's website if you're ever interested. And I also blog at dbakevlar.com. Like I said, there's a lot of EM12C stuff, but whatever has interested me, I do a lot of uh, multi-terabyte databases, so you'll see a lot of DSS environments and things like that, how to bring down and uh, uh, mostly just OLAP cubes, things like that. How how can I report on this data faster? So I'm going to start out with just a brief history of AWR and ASH um, for the people that are new to it. Um, the ASH environment, Active Session History, as well as AWR, the Automatic Workload Repository, was introduced in Oracle 10G. Um, this was the evolution of the actual Stats Pack. A lot of people, you know, was very impressed with Stats Pack when it came out, especially if you ever used UtilB and UtilE Stat, as well as tracing, as a way of looking at a big picture of what was happening in the database. But there were improvements that could be made. Um, there was also overhead that occurred in the database by turning turning these on and people said, is there any way that we can do this? And uh, I know the people like Graham Wood and John Gershwitz, J JV, they took this on and said, you know, we need to do something that is non-locking, that's always on, that will always be available to the DBA as well as the developer, and I am big about that, it is, should be available to the developer as well, to view and see performance data, resource usage, anything that's going on in this database that's a collection process that will not lock and create impact to the database environment. They created this ASH as well as AWR with a lot of complex um, you know, work as well as actual research before they put it into place in 10G. Um, do know that this does require the management tuning pack license from Oracle. A lot of people would like it to be free. It is not. You do need to license it, but cost effective, yes it is. I do believe every database environment should think about investing in it. Now get into the actual ASH architecture. A lot of people may not realize that it is in a memory buffer. There is a special memory buffer that is in the SGA. It's a circular buffer. And the actual ASH process by the MMON light will write forward into this buffer. So it's actually grabbing the newest data that's going into the system. As while the other person is reading it, they will be reading reverse. So there's a pointer in that system. So if you're looking from it, you're looking from this time point that you're actually going into it, going back, as well as the actual ASH is writing forward, getting the newest data. 
um, this circular buffer will get will actually write out one out of ten samples into the AWR. That is, you can see it's a direct path right into the AWR SysOx table space, and that unless it runs out of space, so keep that in mind. If it runs out of space, it will also write to the AWR, and that data is then written to the DBA HIST active SES history. These are session state objects that are coming from the Enron light. So this is all the data that is being collected on those one second samples. Now the AWR architecture is very, very similar and I don't think it is as interesting, but it actually encompasses everything from the ASH as well as its own AWR. So you've got the foreground and the background processes reading into the in-memory statistics and those are collected by the Emon as well as the Emon Lite that takes the ASH data, which we see as V$ views, and then writes it to the AWR workload repository as snapshots into the DBA views that we collect from the actual database when we're querying from there. This actual architecture was designed very, very carefully by Oracle to ensure that there was, was no locking in the database when you're querying it. Now keep in mind that it also is not just used by the AWR reports. The ADDM reporting or Automatic Database Diagnostic Monitor, it uses it as well. Uh, this report a lot of times gets a bad name by most DBAs and I think it is, is that it has a tendency to look at the database not deeply, it's a very high level report. It will quickly come up with recommendations that if you have somebody that isn't a DBA or isn't somebody that understands database tuning, will quickly say, just add more memory, quickly add more memory. And that can be a bad sign for a database administrator. They're like, you know, no, we need to look at why this is requesting more memory. We need to tune it. We need to see why it's making this recommendation versus maybe somebody who is non-technical that says, okay, just add more memory, which we see is a hardware recommendation for a software problem. Um, there's also the SQL, SQL Tuning Advisor and the Segment Advisor. These also use the AWR repository to make their recommendations when you see them through the Enterprise Manager or run from the command line. By default, these snapshots are every hour and the retention is seven days. Both are modifiable. You can change them any way you want. I have a preference to keep the actual retention at six months and I have 10 minutes on my actual um, snapshot time. Um, I will tell you that it takes up more space in the SysOx table space. You need to take that into consideration when you change the retention time. Snapshots can be taken at any given time though. If you feel that you have a performance issue that you need to address, it's very simple to run that next statement there against the DBMS workload repository, create snapshot. It'll create a snapshot for you and you can work from there. Now ASH data, the samples from active data say sessions are taken every second. The data is held, as we said, inside an actual buffer in memory. Um, this is built into the Oracle kernel and it's accessed through the V$ active session history view. Um, in the AWR, AWR snapshot, one in every 10 rows from the ASH buffer is placed into the AWR repository and as we said, it's managed by the MMNL, that's the Memory Monitor Light. Um, it shouldn't be used to track occurrence. Occurrence is not going to be utilized in here like you're going to see it in the AWR data. Now the Enterprise Manager makes it very, very easy for you to run this. This is a picture from the actual Enterprise Manager 12C allows you, once you're in an actual database interface, for you to click on performance, go down, down to the AWR, and click on AWR report. You can then pick your actual snapshots and run your report from there. It will actually output an HTML version of the AWR report for the snapshots that you have chosen, and then you can actually go through the report from there. Running an ASH report, there's a number of different places, remember, that you can run these with NEM. These are usually the general versions that you're going to look at. Um, the ASH report is usually run from a session level. Once you're within a session, you can choose to run an ASH report and choose your actual time. Always remember that ASH is by time, not by snapshot. You set your start and date, end date, and then generate the report. You do have the choice to save any of these HTML reports locally. You don't have to just generate them from here and that they're temporary. Now the HTML format of the ASH report comes out like this. It's a very nice, nicely generated report. It's something that you can share with other people, you know, developers, management, um, users that have questions about performance. They may not understand all the data in it, but it is something that's presentable in a professional manner. Now my preference is always 
running reports from the command line. Um, I won't lie, I like the text version of the report. I've never been much for the HTML. Um, I do like the specific reports as well. Not just you know running the standard reports of AWR report and ASH report, which are the general reports that you were seeing that are generated from the enterprise manager as well. Um, I also like the AWR SQL report. This is a SQL ID specific report. Um, I think a lot of times you'll have one SQL ID and you want to know what happened at that time. You can actually take from the snapshots and run that third report down and it will tell you what has happened in it. We'll go into those with more specifics here in a second. There's also less known AWR reports. The AWR info report we're going to go over in a little bit. It's a general report along with the AWR uh, difference report. This is a comparison report between snapshots. Um, this is very helpful for a database administrator. If you are looking at a snapshot in time and say, you know, between 9 and 10, it was the exact same workload as what happened between 10 and 11, but there was a huge difference in performance. I want to know what happened. You can run this report and put in those two sets of snapshots, and it will actually do a comparison and tell you what was different about those windows. I think this is an invaluable report to most DBAs. You also have the actual migration report. It migrates the 11G baseline data into the pre-11G baseline data into 11G baseline tables. Uh, anyone who had that data that really needed to use it once they got into an 11G upgraded database, it is available then. And then you have the rack aware AW reports. Know that most of these reports, they are not. They're not going to give you data that shows you from both or multiple nodes. It's only going to show you the data from the node that you are running it from. Now the AWR info report is something that a lot of people will not be aware of unless you actually run it from the command line. Um, it is a snapshot interval information. Its basic info is on instances and the nodes, so it's going to give you across the board on here. The, uh, there's no user application uh, schema info. It's the space usage on the actual sysosks table space along with the workload repository history tables and the non-AWR objects ordered by size. Um, the snapshot info, it's also going to show you if there's any errors that occurred once it was taking actual snapshots, and it tells you about the actual advisor tasks. Now, as you're looking at this report, and I know the text is a little small on it, um, you're looking at these and you're going to go in and it tells you, are there different nodes? Is this an actual rack environment? So it'll tell you about the different instances involved, along with how much space usage is being taken by these different schemas that are involved in the system. It then goes on and tells you about, there's a lot of other data that goes on in, in here, but I do find this information a little bit more valuable of the actual advisor tasks that occurred, if there were any errors on any of them as it ran through them, and then the ASH usage info. Now anyone who wants to become familiar with what's going on inside AWR and ASH and what kind of space and resources it's using, this can be extremely valuable to you. Now I'm going to jump in and actually say this is a scenario for ASH and AWR and how I use it in real life. Um, this was a Rack 2 node, it's version 10.205, so be aware that I am working off a of 10.205, not an 11G environment for this example. Um, it is an Enterprise Manager 12C that you're going to see any uh, EM12C uh, pictures from, I don't think there's many. Um, the application weights were seen in the EM performance page that you're seeing there at the bottom and that window that you can see the actual grayed out area there. Um, out of ordinary CPU resource usage was seen as well as 50 minute time of the evaluation. The AWR is set on a 10 minute interval in this environment for the snapshots. Now as I ran this, the actual AWR was showing. You can see it in the actual 50 minutes that I grabbed and then you can see the top five events. I actually stopped right at the top two because you can see the CPU time was 69%, then row lock contention was 28.8. Right there, there was no need to go any farther into the top five. I knew that I had my issue right there. And then the top SQL by elapsed time, as you can see, I kind of erased out what was uh, pertinent to the client. Um, but you can see there was an update statement. And then you can see that also there was a select statement. Both of these were coming from the same Apex application page. 
We can actually see the amount of times that it was executed. And we can see that the second one, the actual select statement, never did finish. It has zero. It never finished the actual execution. And we can actually see each of the SQL IDs that were involved in this. Once I actually find the top SQL, one of the next choices that I make is to drop down into the AWR segment, segment info. I've always found this extremely uh, helpful because I want to know what am I waiting for. Um, you know, I already know from the top five wait events, but what does it look like from the physical standpoint? I'm looking in here and I can see that I have a lot of logical reads that are occurring in the system. This here would show the actual owner, the table space name, the objects that I'm waiting on, if there's any sub-objects, what kind of object it is, the logical reads, and how much of a weight it is. Anything that's, you know, 15% or under, it's not even really worth looking at. Um, but for here, you can see that I've got a 42% weight on the first object and a 20%, um, um, I'm sorry, percent of total on the actual logical reads. The physical reads are very, very minor. This was not an impact at all physically. But the row lock weights were quite high. I had 40%, and the first object is actually the primary key of the table for the logical reads. And same thing with the next one. The next is an index for the second object that was also seen in the second part of the logical reads. So after I've seen this, I've kind of looked through this and said, you know, I'm not getting as finite a look as I want. I'm not seeing the granule look that I wanted. So I decided I need to get into ASH and actually look at this a little differently than I'm seeing it from the AWR. Because I wanted to go to ASH was that there was the top SQL then. I could see the top sessions, top weights. I would see blocking sessions if there were any, top objects, and weights by time during the sample interval. Um, Ash actually breaks it down at the end of the report and tells me this is what you waited on during this timeline of this five minute block. So as I looked in here again, it recognizes the page that I was waiting on. So this was 90% of the activity. This is, I'm sorry, the application and then this is the page that was involved in that. This is very helpful if you're going back to a developer, especially in Apex, where you can say, if you say it's just this application, they're going to say there's a lot in that application. If you come back and say it's this page, that makes a big difference for them. So this section, the top modules and clients can be very helpful for that main reason. We can see that 46% of it was waiting right here. Percent of that action was in this area. So I'm going to be looking at page 60 and page 27 from application 10. I then go down and look at my top clients. These clients, there were two that were quite impacting. These two clients are the ones that I'm going to be looking at that were running these pieces here. The actual top SQL statements, it will tell you the percentage that was actually executions that were selects, updates, your PLSQL ex executes, your inserts. It's going to break it all down for you and tell you what were you spending your most time on in your activity along with the actual statements. Again, we're back into the same statement for my rollout contention on my update and then my select statement. It was the same ones that I saw before, but it's breaking down. Now this is where it gets interesting. I have a blocking session. This tells me that I can go in. I have a number of choices from this point when I see this. My blocking session along my top object should be noted. The actual blocking session is, I left the actual table name in here, in fact. Um, this was from my update statement. So I have a number of choices as a DBA when you see this. You can kill the blocking session. You can investigate further. I actually chose to investigate further. Um, the reason was is that this had happened before, and we wanted to figure out exactly what was going on. So I had two SQL IDs, and I apologize, I lost about 12 slides on this and had to redo them, and I didn't put in the second SQL ID here. I will add that back in and tell you what it is here. Um, but the two SQL IDs, this is the first one that's shown here. And I actually ran an AWR SQL report.sql. And by running that, I actually enter in my snapshot time. You can see it here. 
whoops, back, my snapshot time, and then my actual SQL ID, and it outputs a very nice report that tells me a little bit more about what happened during this time for just this SQL ID. So it's an AWR report specific to this SQL ID. It tells me that this actual SQL statement occurred, and then it actually goes into the plan hash value. The information on the weights, what was occurring, buffer gets, disk reads, parse calls, it goes through it all, along with the application wait time, which was extremely important to this. And then the actual um, execution plan, and then the actual SQL, the full statement. If it's a longer statement, this is very helpful because it automatically pulls it for you. This is the second SQL statement, the, the SQL ID that you didn't see in that first slide. Again, same snapshot, gives me the information about the statement. This is that select statement from page 60. It has quite an extensive um, execution plan, didn't even fit on this slide. The cost on it is extremely high. The interesting thing was is that this is what was going on. Sorry, got a quick clicking. Um, subsequent ASH reports actually show the uh, block sessions were becoming blocking sessions as we killed one. Um, we would find that the next one become the blocking session. What was occurring is the update ses uh, session and the uh, select statement were part of the same process. It would go from the first page to the second page. Um, they had no commit between this, so it was a background process that was part of APEX that would do the update statement, but then it would go into this large select that was quite heavy, and then it would issue the commit. You had one node waiting for the other node and vice versa in all these sessions as uh, it went through this each time. Uh, went back to the developer and asked them to just issue a commit before doing the select, and also went through an AWS SQL ID report and made them specific recommendations on tuning for the select statement and brought that down from 26600 on the cost down to 180 I think. Um, and that made a huge difference, and this took care of the problem. But between all these reports, we were able to figure out what was going on as one became a new blocking session through ASH, as well as the SQL ID report, giving us the execution plan, the actual execution plan that was occurring during the time of execution, and giving us this information that we were able to utilize and give them uh, performance recommendations. So now we're going to go on to the second part here, querying ASH data directly. Um, this is an area that I kind of added into these slides after um, Graham Wood and uh, John Bershowitz, John, JB, uh, presented at our mug uh, for our QEW about two weeks ago. Uh, they had a lot of questions about querying ASH data directly, and there's, they didn't seem to have a lot of data for where to get this data from, you know, where to, where to get these queries from. So I tried to put something together that was just basic queries of querying ASH data directly, and then I'll go into some links on where you can get more. Um, I just think it's very valuable if you know where to get uh, or how to query this data for yourself, as well as get, you know, just bits and pieces of information if you don't want the full report. And I think that's it. We're looking for more defined reporting. Um, you don't have to grab the entire report if you don't want to, um, the detail weights um, that are of interest, you know, and this is important that you can join to non-AWR objects. And like I said, these are simple queries. I didn't get fancy with any of these. Um, I think if you don't keep it simple, you end up getting hurt. The actual V$ active session history table is very interesting. I think that it's broken up, and this is the 10G version. Know that. I actually pulled the 10G from the database that I grabbed. 11G has more columns and more definitive data, um, but it's broken up very, very specifically. At the very top, you actually have the sample ID and the, uh, the sample time, which is utilized by this table, versus the actual session info, which is the next large chunk of it, the SQL info, the PL SQL info, then your weight info, your object info, and application info. There's also the transaction ID, which is the XID that's in there, and then flags. The flags are something new that's used for future use. It's not utilized yet, and I don't see it utilized in 11G yet. Um, but this information is there for you to query and to join on, 
be very careful what you're joining it to. Um, I think that's one of the, the most important things as you're, you're taking these. The first query we're going to go into is the weight events across nodes. Um, this information you can see is by instance ID. It actually shows you which node you're looking at. This was on, uh, again, that 10G rack, um, two nodes. Uh, it shows you the actual SQL ID, shows you the instance ID, how much is on CPU, which happened to be nothing at that moment, uh, what is waiting on CPU, and then the event and the session count. Uh, this can be extremely helpful for you as you're seeing, you know, what is utilizing CPU at any given time? Um, what am I actually, you know, waiting on CPU? All of the data is right there, easily to be pulled. Keep in mind of how to um, query sample time. You're going to see this over and over again. Uh, from what I understand from uh, JB and Graham Wood, this is one of the areas that's most likely uh, miscalculated. So take your time and verify what you're doing with the sys date when you're grabbing time. Um, I've seen people drop samples left and right and not get the right data. You can query the actual top 10 SQL IDs in the last 10 minutes. You can see here where I have the sys date minus 10 slash 24 times 60. It seems like an easy calculation, but again, this is where they say most people have challenges with it. I'm just querying from the V$ active session history where the dB time in seconds, and I'm summing it up, and it actually gives you the SQL ID, dB time in seconds, and it's ordered by and gives you the top 10. Now, you will see, um, I know there's a bug in 11G, 11.203, I believe, too, where you will see the SQL ID comes up as null. This is, still has not been fixed. Um, there's also uh, where the SQL ID isn't the parent ID and it may not bring it up, too. So you may see a few nulls, but it's getting there. It's getting better. The SQL ID and the CPU usage. You can actually query these again. This is number on CPU, number waiting on CPU. So it shows you the actual SQL ID, the instance ID. Again, this is not a, it's getting it across. It's showing you both nodes. The number on CPU, the numbers of them waiting on CPU. The I.O. objects waiting on or through ASH. This one here, you're actually looking at the, uh, this is a join with DBA objects. So you can see that I've actually joined with something that is not an ASH table. And it shows you the current object number, the estimated I.O. weights, the estimated DB time, and the object name. These are going to be very, very helpful when you're looking for your objects that you may need, um, especially I'm looking at it more for partitions. Uh, partitioning. Uh, this, uh, this actual database does not have anything that would be of concern for that, but I have utilized this for that reason. SQL text with ASH. Um, this is the most recent five minutes. Now this one here, as you're pulling it, you'll notice that um, it's joined with V$SQL. It has a couple outer joins on it. And the output, although I can't show you the actual SQL that it pulled, I apologize, I do show you the actual SQL ID. The select statements that it's going through, how many times it occurred, and the timeline that it occurred, in how many times it happened in that time. Now, Tyler Muth had sent me a um, really nice ash mining query. And um, I was so rude, I went and took a piece of it and hacked at it. <laughs> but I really like this. I really do like this. This came in handy for a load test. Um, I was doing a load test for a client and wanted to see just the uppermost data of what we were, what was occurring, you know, during the when they would hit it with 3,000 users concurrently against a system. And this query was very helpful in that you can see where we actually selected the snap, the actual weights 
for each one of these. You know, how much is CQ max, DB weight ratio, you know, the, um, the executions, the reads, the commits, all of this information. And the fun part is, is that you can change this to do almost anything with it. Um, the redo info, the logon info, hard parsing, any of that can be added into this query, but it gives you a nice output like you're seeing right here at the top where you're seeing the snap, the duration, the end, the instance, so it tells you which node along with the percentage or the weights. And this was extremely helpful when I was doing this load test. I was able to see this data very clearly and give the actual client just the info that I needed. Um, sometimes the reports are really, really nice. Other times it doesn't give us what we're looking for. We're looking for resource usage. And this is a very clear example of what that will give you. Now the thing to remember um, when querying this data, and this comes from the people, we've all been doing it for a while now, is keep it simple, don't reinvent the wheel. There are some good examples out there, um, be careful, but uh, there are some examples that are already out there so you don't have to write it from scratch. Um, Samples are an alias for time, not for counts. Uh, keep that in track, too, that samples are different than SNAP IDs and how they actually pull data. It is time. Samples is our time. Um, and just understand what is valuable compared to the package reports. Um, if you're just pulling something that's already in the package reports, it may not be worth it. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, very granular data, it's out there. Ash collects so much. And, you know, we're only hitting the very tops of that so far. Um, you know, we're already seeing that as some of the data that we're um, digging down into with Ash Analytics, the VM12C. Uh, be aware of rack and rack node specific data. You will notice very clearly when it tells you that this is just coming from this first node and you can end up with uh, inaccurate data if you're not careful. Um, take care when querying your object dollar or your object um, file numbers and block numbers. Um, there are some issues still with different versions, so take care to ensure that you know what you're actually pulling on that. And check the time that is available in the buffer. Don't assume. Um, one of the things that I lost in here, I did have a slide telling you how to pull the data, a query for pulling uh, the time for the actual buffer. I will make sure that ends up in the final set of these slides since it has disappeared. I just noticed that. Um, some gentlemen that love this stuff and have been very, very good about putting things out there. Um, my coworker, Carl Arrow, he just loves Ash and AWR data. He's pulling it all the time. If you have a chance, definitely go out and look at his blog. Um, Tyler Muth has started digging into this stuff too. He and Carl, I think, have worked on a few things as well. And uh, there is something called Ash Masters, which was done by J.B. Gramwood and Kyla Haley. Um, I really like their site, um, although I think Kyle is out there. And I have to ask, Kyle, you've got to answer me on this on the chat. Tell J.B., you've got to tell me, why does J.B. have nothing out here? So I'm going to give him a hard time about this. I hope you know. Because <laughs> he has so much to offer and there's nothing in his actual page. And then I also have a couple things out of mind. I put a link out here for my For Love of Ash and AWR, which goes over a lot of the reports. Um, I also have one that goes over the rack versions of the reports. Uh, I hope to put more out there on querying the actual Ash data, as well as there's some uh, uh, slides out there for my Ash Analytics stuff, too. Um, if you have any questions, definitely look at these websites, check out their code as well as the ones that I've put out there. Uh, it's very, very interesting and can be incredibly helpful to anyone who's doing performance tuning uh, challenges for um, resource usage. Uh, I've taken some of the data and actually turned it into a repository, uh, a secondary one on my RMAN catalog database, and just held this data out there and stored it by the DBID, started partitioning it by DBID, and then secondary by the actual sample or um, snapshot, and uh, was able to query it at any time. And when someone would come to me and say, you know, Kellen, the, you know, the database hasn't grown that much. You know, the, the performance hasn't changed that much. Why do we need to buy more hardware? Why do we need to, you know, grow this? What's going on? 
you could pull this data and it was a very high level report that would come back and say, this is what's changed. This is how much I.O. has gained, you know, how much more I.O. we're doing in the last year. This is how much uh, CPU usage has increased in the last year. It makes a big deal for any DBA when you can produce this when somebody comes to you on the spot and says, I need to understand. And I think it's time to turn this back over to James. Hi, Kellen. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'd just like to add a few comments that have come in, and I would just like to, to add to the comments as well. It's been a fantastic presentation, and I think everybody here has really enjoyed it. Thank you for sharing that with, with me via the question panel through this webinar, and also a number of people have tweeted about it, so, so thank you as well. And I'm really pleased that this, this session is exactly what you, you are looking for. Uh, so, so we do have a, a number of questions which I'm just going to go through now, so please bear with me as I get to the, the top of the questions. <clears throat> also, if you haven't typed a question in and you'd like to ask Kelly something, please do so in the question panel. I mean, this is obviously a great opportunity to explore Ash and AWR a little bit more detail in, in particular in relation to your, your own environment and the kind of things that you're working on. Okay. Sorry, please bear with me because there's, there's quite a few comments about the screen at the beginning, uh, so I'm just finding it a little bit difficult to get to the beginning of the, of the question. Okay, I think, I think I'm here now. Sorry folks, I didn't realize my two screens would end up being so confusing. Okay, so the first question we have is from Abdul Mohammed. Thank you, Abdul. And he's asking if one out of ten samples are written to AWR, are we not missing out some session information? Is there a way to increase that? There is no way to increase it, and that question was actually posed to JB as well as Graham Wood um, two weeks ago. He said, yes, there is some data that's being missed, but at the same time, you look at it, you're going one out of 10, and it's one second, that's 10 seconds, so one out of every 10. What are you really missing at that point? They found that there was very, very little, almost impossible to miss at that point. Um, so yes you are missing a little bit of data, but it's almost impossible to miss anything at all with that kind of granule of snapshot. Thank you, Kellen. A question here from Todd Laubach. Thank you, Todd. Uh, he would just like you to explain again what you mean by occurrence. Occurrence. How often did the actual query occur? It's not going to show that in ASH versus AWR. Thank you, Kellen. Uh, the next question from Robert Schlonk. Uh, thank you, Robert. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. Uh, he's asking, our lead DBA claims there is a security risk in allowing access to ASH within Enterprise Manager. Is there a way around this? I don't know of any security risk with ASH. Um, maybe somebody at Oracle can explain that to me, but I know of none whatsoever. Um, I think there's a challenge there with a lot of database administrators that you need to have, you know, this tight hand control over the database. Yes, your database should be secure. I completely agree. Security is a, a challenge for all DBAs, but there's a difference between security and control. Um, a database is the company's property, and it should be in its best performance. It should have all the features that are needed so that everybody can do their job to the best of their ability. I am a strong proponent of ensuring that my developers have access to the vDollar and DBA views and that they have access to the enterprise manager so that they can produce the best code and the best performing you know, applications possible. That's my job as a DBA to work with them as a team member. So any DBA that says that ASH is a, a actual security risk, I would ask them to prove that. Thank you, Kellen. Uh, next question from Samson G. Thank you, Samson. Uh, so can you give some more details on DB time in AWRS? 
DB time is interesting um, because DB time is, and I'm trying to remember the exact calculation. I may have to go look it up. My brain has just gone blank. Um, because DB time is everything that's happening in the foreground processes and everything that's calculated. And I, uh, I apologize. He may have gotten me on that one. Okay. I, I'm going to have to go look that one up for you because I, it's, it's very clear and it's very straight in my brain and of course it's all missing right now. No problem Kevin. Of, of course as always I will post the video on All Things Oracle as well as the, the Redgate website. Uh, so maybe Kevin if you could just add a, a little comment when I post on All Things Oracle. I will be glad to. Fantastic, thank you. Next question from Amir Shah. Thank you Amir. Do you use TK Prof and SQL tracing anymore, or have you given all that up in favor of ASH? No, I use TKPROF and tracing very much so. Um, I've always joked, I'm, I'm a method R girl. Um, I, I do believe in, I, I use method R tools as well. Tracing is very much a session level tuning process. Uh, when I have a session that I'm trying to find out very, very granular data about what's going on in it, I'm going to trace it. Uh, TKPROF provides me some incredible data from that. Uh, Method R, what Method R tools provide me is a little bit more information about it from the network layer. Um, I don't see that in TKPROF, but yes, I believe in using all tools that are available to me to give the best performance in a database. Thank you, Kellen. So if you just bear with me, there's a question here, but I think it's been split a little bit, so if you just bear with me. So the question from uh, Roger Shell. Thank you, Roger. Uh, could you please type it in again? I've got the first part, uh, but you've missed the the end part. So if you could type that question in again, it's it's about determining frequency of sampling, and I'll put that to Kelly. Okay. A question from Oliver. Ruka, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Thank you, Oliver. And this is, he currently has standard edition databases. Are there any license restrictions when it comes to querying ASH and AWR directly? Um, I'd have to go check it. Um, standard edition does have some challenges with it, but I think you just need to also um, buy the licensing. Um, I'm trying to remember because I did have a couple standard editions. I don't work on them very often. I, I won't lie, I, I think I've had three in my entire career. <laughs> I'd have to go check, but I'll be glad to check on it and put an answer out there on the web. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. So a question here from Chaudra Shelkar Shastri. Again, I hope I pronounced that okay. In one of the first reports, he saw DB time, which seemed larger. I'm not sure if it had different units than the elapsed time, so DB time which seemed larger than the elapsed time. Could you explain what it was referring to, please? Um, I'd have to go back and look at what we were up against here. One of the first... I think I'd have to know which one that he was seeing I don't know which report he was seeing where DB time was larger than the CPU time. Okay, so please, please, uh, Chandrash Shilka, if you could confirm that, and I can try and put it to Kellen at the end. Okay, well, a couple of questions, as always, about whether this this is being recorded. The webinar is being recorded. I will send you a link to where you can get the the recording from. Uh, I think Kellen mentioned earlier that she wants to add a few things to the slides. Uh, Kellen, will you be able to make the slides available too? Yes, yeah, and I'll add that there's a couple slides that are missing and one that needs an update too. I apologize, I lost 12 slides yesterday. I'm, I'm not very happy with PowerPoint 2010 right now. <laughs> Thank you, Kellen. Okay, next question from Jack. We've got quite a few questions here, so I'm going to do my best to get through them all. Any questions that we can't get through today? 
will be posted on All Things Oracle, and hopefully Kevin can answer them there. So next question from Jekka Narashama. Uh, thank you, Jekka. Uh, he's asking, can we have an AWR report and an ASH report in HTML format and walk through it highlighting yes. the sections that need attention? When you say highlighting the sections that need attention, I'd like him to elaborate on that. You can have both of them in HTML format. I can also tell you that um, uh, Tim Gorman has a great script out there that will, um, it actually grabs the ASH report and um, puts it into, it actually um, puts, appends it, appends pieces of it into the AWR. It mines both sections of data. And you can see that out on his uh, evdbt.com site. Fantastic. Thank you, Kellen. And I'll actually link to that article as well when I post the video on All Things Oracle. Uh, next question from Charlie Hudson. Thank you, Charlie. How does one configure the ASH buffer and what are the considerations for setting its size? Um, there are none. It is not something you actually um, configure. It is done uh, dynamically by or, or not dynamically. It's done automatically by Oracle. Uh, it's not something that you manage or change. Thank you, Kevin. A next question from Brian Pardy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, can we please get text versions of the ASH queries from the slides along with the slide deck? Yes. Thank you. So a question here from Steve uh, Gardiner. Thank you, Steve. Uh, he's asking uh, what kind of metrics do you like to review? So as an example, he likes metrics such as LIO or average active sessions per minute, per hour. What other metrics should people be looking at to review to optimize performance? I think it depends on your database environment. Um, you know, I come from a background of multi-terabyte databases. It was very important to me to look at the uh, amount of temp space used um, by, by individual users, uh, the amount of I.O. that was occurring. But in an OLTP environment, it's going to be very different. Um, you know, it just depends what environment you're in. Uh, my databases, I have different ones that I'm looking at. Uh, I, I guess that's the challenge. You know, it depends. There's always that answer everybody hates. But it does depend on your database environment what metrics you're going to be querying for. Thank you, Kevin. So this is a question from Reginald Bailey. Thank you, Reginald. And this follows on from a from something that you were talking about earlier. And I think it's a, it's a really good point. Uh, and what Reginald would like confirmation on is, is so he's saying so there is no problem with letting developers access the Ash tables and running the Ash reports. Um, now, I sh I should change that. I should change that. That's probably misleading for you. Um, usually my developers are more than happy to let me run those ASH reports and those AWR reports for them. They don't run them. Uh, what I think is extremely important is that they have access to these V-Dollar views that they can query um, things that they understand. I think it's incredibly important to teach people to be better developers and by them becoming better developers I also become a better DBA. But when it comes to ASH and AWR reports, no, I'm the one who's running them. They, they don't even have interest in learning how to run them. Thank you, Ken. So there's a, a couple of questions uh, that have been asked around uh, execution and uh, on uh, session history. So I'm going to try and sort of put these together in one. Uh, I hope they'll, they'll cover what everybody's looking for. But the, so the general question here is about how can you get specific information on the number of sorry how can we get information on the number of executions during a specific time uh, and you're going to see it, that so oh go ahead i just wanted to there's a few other parts to it which have come from different questions but thank you everybody for for asking these questions so for example how about so we've got kind of active sessions can we look into the history every hour can, can we sample every second uh, is there a specific time in the past from a connection pool of sessions? Now, was the question about how many active sessions were occurring in the database at a given time? That's correct, yes. Uh, are you able to expand on that a little bit more? Uh, sort of to kind of generally looking well, at can... looking at what kind of information you can get on executions and session history? 
Well, if they're looking for active sessions that occurred across the board in a database environment, they can look at V$ resource usage, I believe. That's going to give them that information. Um, I have a query I can even put out there on your site that will do that for them. Um, if they're looking for the amount or the quantity of executions on any given SQL statement, they're going to see that in the AWR for a given snapshot window that they pulled, or they can do it for that actual SQL ID for an AWR SQL report. So they can do it for that one too. It'll give them the number of executions for that specific SQL. Um, so it just depends. I wasn't sure which they were looking for. If they were looking for the number of active sessions occurring in the database, or if they're looking for the number of executions on a SQL statement. Thanks, Kelly. So, sorry, that was probably my fault trying to combine a, a couple of questions together, which, which looked like a, they dealt with a, a similar topic. It's all right. Okay, so the next question from uh, Anand Prakash. Thank you, Anand. So he's saying that they had an I.O. spike for 20 minutes sorry, a one o spike for 20 minutes on the only second instance of a two-node rack. ADDDMRPT for that period shows two SQL lead causing significant impact. Do you have any advice on, on how to approach such issues and would ASH report along with AWR SQL report help be helpful? I think it would, um, especially the AWR, the segment info as well as the actual SQL info. Those two items from that AWR report is going to tell them information of what's going on. They're going to be able to see, you know, that I.O., was it from, you know, was there some kind of roll lock? Was there physical reads, logical reads? You know, what was happening? Was it spilling over? Was there temp um, from the table space? I mean, you can see all of that in there, um, as well as looking at the ASH report will give them specific information as well. Um, they could also look and see if it's I.O. is what is their uh, resource usage for temp and things. I mean, that's one of the first things that I look at. Uh, if somebody is performing huge hash joins or sorts, it can spill over from PGA into temp, and that can be heavy on I.O. in any environment. Thank you, Kellen. So the next question we have here is from Perry Coop. Thank you, Perry. And uh, I think this is quite an interesting one. I'm, I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to, to answer it, but it, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's, um, how do you know that you have tuned the queries as best as possible and it is time to turn on hardware changes? Also, what numbers for I.O. weights and writes should be considered reasonable? Um, I usually, when I'm approaching a tuning activity, I come up with a list of top tens. Um, I, and that top 10 isn't just my top 10. I involve my actual users um, because what I may see as a performance hit, they may not. So I say, you know, this session that takes 20 minutes is really a high hitter on my report. And they may look at it and go, you know, I don't care about that one. I care about this one that I run three times a day that takes five minutes. So it's extremely important to involve them as well because that's, it's, it's partly marketing. You know, you have to sell it to your actual users that you're doing your job. Um, but you come up with that top 10, and when you finish that top 10 and you look at them and say these are you know, low-hanging fruit, they're easy fixes, or they're not so easy fixes. Some of those not so easy fixes you can look at and say the database has to do this, or it's a, such a complex design issue that we cannot go back and fix it. There is just no physical way. They won't either give the resources, they won't give the... Um, they won't give the time to change it. It is too drastic of a change for the business. At that point, you start looking at hardware. Um, I have been in that situation where we ended up going to a solid state disk choice because um, the application side, which happened to be something called SAS, required that everything be seen in a flat file environment versus um, actually going to dimensions and going to um, fact tables. So we had no choice but to continue on with hardware changes and going to hardware. It, that's where you make that choice. I mean, you, it's a combined choice. It's not a DBA's choice. It's sitting down with your development, your application support, your management, and saying, you know, this is what it's going to cost you. This is what I can offer you in performance. This is what I can offer you in hardware. Know that hardware is never a permanent choice, though. Whatever problems you have in your software, whatever problems you have in your design, will rear its ugly head again because the natural life of the database is to grow. So sooner or later, that problem is going to come back again. So always know that when you choose a hardware solution for a problem. Thank you, Kellen. 
And, and just to, to carry on for that, are there any kind of precautions that you need to take whilst doing performance tuning with the help of AWR and ASH reports, uh, in particular in a rack environment? Um, in Rack or any other environment, I've, I've always joked about the uh, thing to watch for, out for is what's called don't become the uh, tinsel monkey. Uh, tinsel monkey is a term for uh, one of my relatives who visited uh, China had joked about these monkeys they called tinsel monkeys that attacked the tourists for anything shiny. It didn't matter if it was tinsel or tinfoil or gold and jewelry and valuable. And as a uh, DBA, when you're performance tuning, it's extremely important not to jump at anything shiny. You need to keep and get the data behind it to realize it is valuable what you're performance tuning. If you are not performance tuning for time, if you are tuning something that's going to save you a minute versus something that's going to save you five to six hours a day, there's a huge difference there in the time that you're allocating towards that task. So always ensure that your performance tuning on something that is physically going to save you time. I've sat in on many a performance tuning task where, you know, some of the people around me were like, oh, we have to tune this part of the statement here, and you trace the statement out and you realize that was really only 20 seconds of it. It was something completely different that was taking up the 90% of the time they wanted to try to re remove. So that's one of the essential pieces of performance tuning. Thank you, Kellen. Uh, but another question from, from Reginald Bailey. Thank you, Reginald. Uh, what privileges or roles are necessary for developers to access the AWR and ASH tables? Um, they need to have access to the DBA views. Um, I think that when you're getting into the ASH, it's the V$ um, active session history. They need to have the ability to query that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger, for uh, uh, clarifying your question. Uh, so what Roger's asking is uh, how frequently are snapshots taken and how long are they kept? Um, that's up to you and your database. You can look at the actual retention time for AWR. And uh, as I said, the defaults are set to, I believe it's, it's seven days, and they are one every hour for your snapshots. You can change that, but keep in mind that SysOx table has to support it. Uh, the SQL summaries in that can take up a lot of room, so ensure that if you have that space to retain it in your SysOx table space. But you can change it. Um, my preference is every 10 minutes, and uh, I like to keep them for at least 31 days. Thank you, Kelly. So I think some of these questions have already been answered. I apologize if, if, if I miss a question that hasn't been asked, answered. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'll try and put some of the questions up on, on All Things Oracle. If, if I don't, please visit where I post the, the, the video itself and ask the question there, and hopefully we, we can answer it on All Things Oracle. Uh, so I'm just going to take a, a couple more questions before we wrap this session up. So. Okay, so we've got a question here from Joe Morris, and he's asking, do you have any tips on managing the size of sys orcs? Um, there is the SQL summary. You can um, clear that out every once in a while. There was a bug for a while, and I think 10.203, uh, there was extra uh, SQL summaries that weren't being cleared out because what would happen is that a snapshot ID could be related to um, I, an older one could still be related to SQL IDs that were newer ones, so it would keep it. So there is a way of clearing that out. I can't remember the doc number or anything like that, um, but if you look it up on Oracle support, I'm sure it'll show up if you do a query for it. Thank you, Kevin. And also using that AWR, the, uh, the report, the AWR info will also tell you the space usage too. I should have added that, sorry. Thank you. Uh, a question here from, from Harry. Thank you, Harry. Uh, he'd like to know if a grant select on V$ would suffice for ASH. So um, for, of for ash, ASH privilege. Of course it would, yes. I think it's if you want it more specific and just say I just 
just want them to have rights to be dollar, you know, active session history. It's up to you. It's up to the DBA. Um, you know, some DBAs are going to be more particular than others about what rights they give out. Great. Thank you. And the final question uh, I'm going to put to Kelly today is from Amir Shah. Thank you, Amir. And she's asking, why such a frequent polling interval of 10 minutes? What additional information is added? Um, again, it goes on your database environment. Um, I've recently gone to the 10-minute intervals on my OLTP environments that I have with my new clients. Um, before this, I was on multi-terabyte databases. Once an hour was more than enough. You know, uh, most of our, our processes ran for, you know, some of them ran for 6, 12 hours. There was no reason for more than an hour, one an hour. Uh, so definitely, it's up to you. It's your environment. Make intelligent choices. You are the DBA. Thank you very much, Kellen. I know you put up some uh, links, which I think are still on the or on the screen that you finished off with. Uh, there have there have been a couple of requests for additional information, and I wonder whether there are any other blogs or websites where that you know of that could add to this, or is this a kind of a pretty good list of where you can find that information from? It's a good list, and uh, like Ash Masters, I know Kyle and those guys have other links, um, and I have links on my site too. Uh, I have on DBA Kevlar, I do have a site that has links to other sites um, that will be helpful. Fantastic. Brian Pardy would also like you to blog sometime about OEM and DB grants that you provide developers to best permit them to use ASH to assist with their jobs. Yes, I know I've been slow on blogging this last month. I've only blogged once this last month. I'm hoping after I catch up with the books and after Oracle Open World, I'll be able to catch up with some of this. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you once again, everybody, for joining us. Please contact Kelly by her, her website. She's mentioned it a few times. There's some fantastic resources on there. Uh, so please check that out, dbakevlar.com. Uh, Kelly also is quite active on, on Twitter. Uh, again, it would be a great place to find out more information about what Kelly's writing and the kind of things she's doing, particularly with training days as well. Uh, so please follow at DBR, DBA Kevlar. As always, you can contact me directly by email, james.mercer at redgate.com. Please follow me also at all things Oracle. I, I always post things about webinars and the kind of stuff that I'm writing on allthingsoracle.com. So this will be a great place to find out about that. So I'd just like to say thank you once again to Kellen for presenting today's session. I've really enjoyed it, and I, I hope everybody else has too. So thank you very much, Kellen. Thank you.